Would you take your Bibles with me and open to Revelation 18? Revelation 18. As we continue to work our way through the book, we're getting closer to the end. And it may well feel like as you've been following along and reading along that the book ends solely talking about judgment, but there is a very joyous ending to the book. We're getting there. This morning, I want to look once more at uh, the judgment of uh, the enemy, the judgment of God's enemies as we look at the fall of Babylon. Revelation chapter 18. If you pick up a Bible from the back, you'll find Revelation 18 on page 1038. And I want to ask you one more time if you would stand and honor the reading of God's Word. Hear the reading of this chapter of Revelation 18. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. For her sins are heaped as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities." Pay her back as she herself has paid back others, and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed. As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning. Since in her heart she says, I sit as a queen, I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. For this reason her plagues will Come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire, for mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. And the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city, Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her, since no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, and sheep, horses, and chariots, and slaves, that is, human souls. The fruit for which your soul longed has gone from you, and all your delicacies and your splendors are lost to you, never to be found again. The merchants of these wares who gained wealth from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud. Alas, alas, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet adorned with gold, with jewels and with pearls. For in a single hour all this wealth has been laid waste. And all shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors, and all whose trade is on the sea stood far off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning, What city was like this great city? And they threw dust on their heads as they wept and mourned, crying out, Alas, alas, for the great city where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth. For in a single hour she has been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. And the sound of harpists and musicians, of flute players and trumpeters will be heard in you no more. And the craftsmen of any kind will be found in you no more. And the sound of the mill will be heard in you no more. And the light of a lamp will shine in you no more. And the voice of bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more. For your merchants were the great ones of the earth and all nations were deceived by your sorcery and in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all who have been slain on earth would you remain standing as we pray (coughs) 
Father, help us now. You know what you desire to do in this time. So may you do it through the preaching of the word for our good, whether we need conviction or comfort. Whatever it is you desire to do, do for our good and for the honor of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. In Christopher Nolan's science fiction film, Inception, the main character, Dominic Cobb, makes his living by infiltrating people's dreams and stealing ideas and then selling them to the highest bidder. It's a fascinating concept of, of living in someone else's dream, and it's really an intriguing story uh, that takes place in this film. But there's a great risk in Cobb's life. In fact, he's terrified of this one element in his labor. And the element that he's terrified of is that he will confuse the dream world with reality. In fact, he has this token that is really nothing more than a spinning top uh, called a totem. Again, nothing more than a spinning top, but its function in the film is, is necessary. Cobb uses it because as he goes into someone's dream, he can very much become lost. All of a sudden, he can look around and, and think that the dream is reality. We know that concept, don't we? We, too, have woken up from dreams sometime, and, and it felt so much like we were living in reality. It took waking up just to help us to realize that it wasn't reality. And so what Cobb does is he, as he thinks that he's come out of this dream, as he thinks he's in reality, he takes the spinning top and he spins it. And if the top falls as is what happens in the real world, it's an indication to him that he's back in reality. If the top continues spinning, countering what would happen in real life, it's a, it's a reminder to him that he's still immersed in this dream. And, and, and no matter how amazing the dream is, no matter how incredible the, the dreamlike world around him is, he is desperate to want to live in the real world. He wants to live in reality. And so this top he holds on to like a treasure. It's his way, it's something outside of himself, so that when he's lost all his mental bearings and can't tell the dream world from reality, this top calls him back to reality, tells him what is real. I think that's what we find happening in Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18 very much is a chapter that calls us back to reality. Revelation 18 is, is a chapter written from the Lord Jesus Christ in this letter delivered to His early church so that as they look at the Roman Empire around them and see her in all her glory and see all the seductiveness and the attractiveness that the world has to offer, even as John has already pictured that the world worldly culture in his day as being a tool that Satan uses to draw us away. We've said for a number of weeks now, Satan uses different multi-pronged tool here to, to lure the people of God away from him. He uses sometimes the oppressive state. So in the first century, oftentimes there would be emperors, and in the centuries that followed emperors that would rise up and they would sometimes threaten the people of God with, with oppression and persecution and even death if they would not denounce Jesus Christ. That's, that's one arm that the enemy uses in this rule. He will use the oppressive state represented as, as the beast in this book of Revelation sometimes to attack the people of God in a violent and oppressive way. Sometimes he will use the, uh, the teaching of falsehood, perhaps from religious re uh, leaders or others, that will lure people away uh, to follow the beast, to follow Satan by teaching them things that are untrue, things that we witness in our own day as well, where there are false teachers often and people saying, come along, it's not all that bad, just, just go after what is in essence idolatry. It's okay in the end. But there's a third prong in Satan's tool that he uses. And it's the seduction of worldliness. And so just as Satan's tool is sometimes represented as this beast and sometimes as this false prophet, it's also been represented in the book of Revelation as a harlot or a prostitute. A woman who looks very good 
and she is seducing you. Come this way. And she looks really good, even as the adulteress in the book of Proverbs, her lips drip with honey. And you're lured by her. And so this happened again in the first century. I've used one example already, uh, the example of the trade guild in Rome. If you would get along with your guild and you would meet at their Thursday night meeting or whatever it is and devote yourself to a false god, then you could be among the guild and you could have your practice, your trade. You could be a plumber. You could be a craftsman. You could be a uh, one who works in masonry, whatever it is, but you had to devote yourself to false god. And sometimes the lure of riches, the lure of, of being able to make a great living and living in luxury was too much for them to turn away from that devotion to a false god. And that aspect, that prong of Satan's tool of violence against the people of God is represented as the seductive harlot called Babylon. Revelation 18 then is showing us Babylon, this seductive harlot, is not all she cracks up to be. Basically, Revelation 18 strips away all of the adornment, all of the glory that the world and its worldliness has to offer, showing it to be bare, so that we might not continue to live in our dreamlike fantasy world that sees sin as something that offers lasting pleasure and so that we might rightly see it as something that's fleeting. This is what Revelation 18 does. Therefore, this morning what I want to do is I just want to unfold for you, I think, the truths that Revelation 18 shows us and then how our response should be. So the first truth then I want to show you from this text is this. One day, all the glory of what the world has to offer apart from Christ will be stripped away. One day, all the glory of what the world has to offer apart from Christ will be stripped away. The text begins taking up this imagery of Babylon. Again, not, not literally Babylon, but, but this worldliness that was taking place in Rome represented by Babylon, this, this uh, city, representative city. Again, as I said last week, worldliness was, yes, here in Rome, but this is why every believer in every age has been able to look and say, I, I understand Babylon. I understand the, the lure of Rome. It's not always Rome, but even in our own country, we can look around and see this, right? The, the, the seductiveness, the appeal of worldliness in our culture that tempts us to, to walk away from Jesus Christ. And yet the, the announcement here in the first two verses is that the world in its worldliness is going to be judged. John says in verse 1, After this I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. The earth was made bright with his glory, and he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Now you could make note at this point, at this point, Rome hadn't fallen yet. At this point, they might say, well, that seems a bit premature because I'm looking around, the trade guild's still going on. I'm looking around and everybody still seems to be pursuing luxury and getting it. They seem to be pursuing uh, sexual morality and getting it. They're chasing after riches and fame and prestige and they're getting it. It doesn't look like this is all fleeting. But I think what's going on in Revelation 18 is the reason that this angel is pronouncing the judgment of Babylon as if it's already happened is because he's sending a message, this is how certain her judgment will be. Now the Bible does this in other places. In fact, we looked at one this morning in our, our Sunday school class in Romans 8, 29 and 30. Paul says we've been believers, we've been foreknown, predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. We've been called, we've been justified, we've been glorified. Well, we know, and you know, think of something. If we've been saved, yes, I can, I can look back and say, God foreknew me, He predestined me, He called me, He's justified me, but I'm not yet glorified. Why would you speak of that as if it's already done? And I think Paul's message is because it's that certain. Our future glorification as believers is so certain that Paul can speak of it as if it's already accomplished. This is why the rest of Romans 8 then goes on to, to nail down this idea of the security we have in Christ. What can separate me from God's love? Nothing. Who could condemn me? Christ is the one who justifies. Who could bring a charge? It's God who elects, he says. Right? I think we find the same thing here. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the gray. The announcement is made as if it's already happened because it is certain. One day the world and its worldliness will be judged. Now notice here as well that the text describes Babylon as Babylon the great. We see it in other places. Uh, the text speaks of, uh, of the glory of Babylon. Look at uh, chapter 18, verse 10. 
They will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city. Look at verse 19. Alas, alas, for the great city. Or you can just go right up one verse to verse 18. What city was like the great city? Verse 21. So will Babylon the great city. Why is Babylon called the great city or the mighty city so often in this text? What's the same reason that, that something like the United States is exalted in our country? Or a city like New York City or, or Los Angeles or something like this is often exalted. It's a place where you can go and get everything this world has to offer. If you want to live a life of chasing luxury, and chasing immorality, and chasing fame, chasing riches, chasing prestige, you probably don't root yourself in Buck Snort, Tennessee. <laughs> Not to say you can't pursue a number of those things there, but there's a reason why those who have means and want to pursue worldliness often go where worldliness is most effectively pursued. So you can imagine for a second, uh, a man living in New York City who is an unbeliever and pursuing everything this world has to offer. And he is seeking riches, and he is finding riches. He is seeking sexual morality, and he's finding sexual morality with beautiful women. He's seeking fame and prestige, and he's finding fame and prestige. You can imagine why he would say, New York, this great city. Believing he is profiting and benefiting from all the pleasure this world has to offer. Well, that is how Rome would have been viewed in the first century. If you want something, go to Rome. Well, one author has said, it was said in the time that every sin found its home in Rome. And so as these believers were seeking to live up like right, right lives, and yet looking at the worldliness around them, it would have seemed like Rome is a great city by worldly standards. And yet look what happens to this great city. Look at verse 2. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Now listen how she's described. She has become a dwelling place for demons. A haunt for every unclean spirit. A haunt for every unclean bird. A haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. My junior year in January of that year, a friend and I just saved up some money and decided we wanted to go travel Europe. And uh, it, it was a crazy story, and I, I rebuked my parents later for ever letting me do it. But uh, my friend William and I were, were walking through Europe backpacking, trying to find places to stay night after night, and, and it was a crazy trip. But uh, one of the trips we took was to Rome. And I remember standing, the way that, that, that they've done in Rome, it's kind of interesting, is they basically just built a modern city on top of the ancient city. So you can walk along the streets of Rome in the modern city, and yet look down, down from the road, and you see there an old pillar. You see there uh, the ruins of what used to be some palace or temple or something like this. And so as you walk through Rome, you can walk through the modern city and look, and there are all the ruins of the ancient city. Well, this is what verse 2 of chapter 18 is picturing. This great city become merely a place of ruins. You can imagine the text mentions a dwelling place for unclean birds and unclean beasts. You can imagine some, some, some great city or some glorious house that's now simply in ruins so that, that birds are making their homes there with nests. That, that wild beasts are just finding a dwelling place there. That, that lizards are all running all over. He says that, that's what's happened. That, that, that Babylon in its glory is going to become a place like that in ruins. But he doesn't just mention unclean birds and detestable beasts, does he? He also mentions it's become a place for demons and unclean spirits. Why does he mention this? Because here's what I think the effect of this chapter is doing. And 10 of this chapter is. I think what these verses are doing is they're saying to us, worldliness and all its appeal, whether it was manifested in Rome in the first century or whatever in our own century, one day the fleetingness of the world is going to be revealed. One day the glory of worldliness is going to be stripped away and it's going to be left bare like a city that was once great and glorious is now in ruins. And two things will be shown on that final day. When Babylon and the worldliness she represents is judged, two things are going to be shown. One, it was empty. It was empty. The man, as I've described, who's chasing the riches of this world and, and fame and prestige and, and sexual morality. 
one day it will be shown that he who thought he had everything really had nothing. It's become empty. As Jesus says, what's a profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? But the other thing that's going to be exposed is that worldliness is demonic in nature. You see, man following the enemy, blinded to the gospel, is constantly opposing, worshiping his creator as he should do, and instead is worshiping the created order. Paul says this was going on in the book of Romans in chapter 1, and he tells us, though, it goes on in the case of all unbelievers. Unbelievers, by nature, turn away, suppressing the truth of righteousness they know, turn away from worshiping the Creator, and they worship the created order. That is what worldliness was in Rome, and that's what worldliness is today. Devoting ourselves to the created order. That is Satan's design. Satan's design in mine and your life is to tempt us to turn away from the Creator to focus our attention on the creation itself, which is not worthy of our worship. But what Jesus is showing us here in Revelation 18 is that one day all the glory of what this world has to offer apart from Jesus Christ will be stripped away and laid bare and shown for what it is. And therefore, there's an exhortation. If you're taking notes, point two, an exhortation. We must separate ourselves from the lifestyle of those who will face judgment. We must separate ourselves from the lifestyle of those who will face judgment. After announcing that Babylon is going to be judged, Babylon is going to fall for all the nations, he says, verse 3, have become drunk with her. It's just, as if leading, as, as the worldliness leads us away from Christ, he pictures it as sexual morality, but it's idolatry, isn't it? And in verse 3, he says, it's taken away everyone. All the nations have become drunk with the wine of the passion of her morality. Uh, the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. But he says to us in verse 4, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Now here we have to remember, Babylon is a metaphor for worldliness. It's not simply speaking of Rome, the city, or Rome, the empire. The call of verse 4 isn't, Move out of the Roman Empire in the first century. Or, in our day, the call isn't, Move to a place like Bucks, North Tennessee as you can avoid it. This isn't an exhortation to change one's geography. After all, in the first century, where would you go? If you wanted to get out of the Roman Empire, where are you going to go? To some barbaric territory? Well, of course not. This, is, this isn't a command to change one's geography. What he's saying is, uh, told to us clearly as we continue on, come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. For her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. The call here is, don't take part in what world, the world and its worldliness is offering you. The world, yes, is holding out riches as a valiant pursuit. It's holding out sexual morality. It's holding out fame and prestige. But he's saying, don't chase after those things, because if you chase after the sins of worldliness, you're also going to take part in her judgment. This is what he elaborates on in verses 6 and following. She's going to be paid back, double for her deeds. Verse, verse 7, she, she's, she glorified herself, lived in luxury. She, so give her a measure of torment and warning. She, she thought she was untouchable. I said, as a queen, I'm no widow, and mourning I shall never see. Verse 8, for this very reason, her plagues will come upon her. She'll be burned up with fire. Mighty is the Lord God who judged her. The Lord says, listen, I'm going to judge worldliness. So if you're chasing after it, when I come to judge it, you too will take part in her judgment. Think about Lot and his family. The Lord says, I'm going to judge Sodom. So flee the city. In fact, don't even look back. What happened with Lot's wife? She looked back. She turned into a pillar of salt. He says, flee. Get out of there because judgment's going to happen. You might think of it this way. Imagine that you're on your way. 
you, you've been thinking about pursuing uh, illegal drugs and now you're on your way thinking, you know what, I found a place, there's a market on the corner, I'm going to go there, I'm going to buy some, I can deal in drugs, I can get rich, I can have drugs, whatever it is, and you're on your way to that corner when all of a sudden you get there and a sting has been in progress and the police bust in and they, and they run in and they take everybody and they take everybody away in handcuffs to be incarcerated who took part in this and you were there. This is the image God is saying. Don't go there because one day in a single day at a point my judgment's going to fall. And if you're chasing after these things, if your life is characterized as one who is pursuing not Jesus Christ, but the things this world has to offer, then you who have taken part in her sins will also share in her plagues. So he's saying to his people, I want you to flee, run away from worldliness and run towards Jesus Christ. And yet here, I think we could ask a question. And that, and that question could be like this. I mean, you could even say to me, well, Lee, obviously, he's going to judge one whose lives are characterized in this way. But, but it doesn't really mean, does it, that, that we can't really dip our toe in that world? I mean, after all, you may say, it's, it's not like my life is characterized by sexual morality. I mean, I pursue it a little bit, and then, and then I come out of it. I feel bad about it. I get out of it. I, I may go back, back to sexual morality again, but then I feel bad about it, and I come out of it. Or... or I, I, I pursued fame. I, I pursued this. I want to be made much of. I've, I, I've gossiped, and I want people to think much of me. But, but it's not like that characterizes my whole life. I'm, I do it, and I feel bad about it, and I come back out of it. So, so, so isn't the idea that we shouldn't be characterized by it, but, but not, not kind of a avoid it at all cost, fight it like it could send you to hell? Surely not that. But I think that brings us to this Third point I want us to see in the text. A danger. Running after the sin of this world leaves us deceived with hard hearts and blinded to what is real. Running after the sin of this world leaves us deceived with hard hearts and blinded to what is real. Now let me just tell you what I mean by this, and I'll show you why I think we can draw this point from the text. Sin works in such a way that it by nature is deceiving. It by nature is hardening. And it by nature is blinding. So yes, we can go through life sometimes where we pursue sin, and then we're able to see clear enough, and we pull back out of it. But every time we do that, we take a risk. Because what can happen with sin is that all of a sudden, what once appeared to you as obviously wicked, once you pursue it, can all of a sudden deceive you in such a way that it doesn't look as bad as it once did. It can harden your heart in such a way that you, who, who, who once felt your heart racing as you, as you walk towards sin, now you just don't feel that as much. Your heart is hardened. It doesn't seem as repulsive as it once did. It can be blinding to the point that, that you who once said, I know this is wrong, are now saying, I'm just not so sure anymore. Sin can lead us to lose our bearings, much like the risk Dominic Cobb took in the movie as he infiltrated people's dreams. All of a sudden, what is unreal, what is false, what is empty, and what is passing can all of a sudden look so appealing and so clear, and so right, so that we can begin defending something once knew clearly was wrong. We can find our place in a place where repentance is impossible. Not because we cannot theoretically repent, but because our heart feels no desire to repent. Our heart feels no need to repent. This is the risk of pursuing sin. It deceives us and it hardens us and it blinds us. This is why the author of Hebrews says, you need people to encourage you every day while it's still cold today so that you're not hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. This is the reason we must not even flirt with sin. Now, where do we see that in the text? I think we see it in verses 9 through 19. In verses 9 through 19, you have three different groups who mourn the fall of Babylon. Starting in verse 9, you have the kings of the earth mourning. And the kings of the earth 
who committed sexual morality and lived in luxury with her. That is, they pursued the worldliness that, that Babylon was offering. They will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. And the merchants of the earth, a second group, beginning in verse 11. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn for her since no one buys their cargo any more. And it goes on to list all of their cargo and all of a sudden we see these poetic snippets where they're mourning. We also see the same thing with uh, the merchants of the sea. Verse 15. The merchants of these wares who gain wealth from her will stand far off in fear and in torment, weeping and mourning aloud. Verse 17, the second part, and all shipmasters and seafaring men, uh, sailors, and all whose trade is on the sea stood far off. They will weep, verse 19, alas, alas, for the great city where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth. Do you see what's going on here? They pursued Babylon. They were pursuing all the worldliness that Rome had to offer. And so what Jesus is saying is, on the day when Rome is judged, they're going to look and they're going to mourn. Because the kings of the earth had grown rich in living luxury. They were dependent on the stability of Rome. And so when Rome crumbles, so all the lifestyle that they were pursuing in their worldliness crumbles as well. The merchants of the earth had grown rich. Because people were caught up in pursuing luxury and they had benefited from that. The merchants of the sea had done the same thing. And now you have three groups mourning because Babylon is no more. It's fallen in a single hour. But the question to ask is this. Why are they mourning? Why are the kings of the earth and the merchants of the earth and the merchants of the sea mourning? And the answer to this question is they're mourning because they look at Babylon and they see she being judged in her worldliness and they have lost any hope for pursuing riches through her. They've lost hope for pursuing what the world held out through her. That is to say, this isn't some kind of righteous mourning. This is a mourning because we're losing a chance to continue to pursue our worldliness. Let me give you an example of this. Again, just using a silver illustration, suppose a man were on his way to the prostitute's house. A house of prostitution. And he's going there because he wants to take advantage of what that house has to offer. And so as he's on his way to this house of prostitutes, again, in my illustration this always happens, the police bust in. But he's not there. He's still got many steps to go. He's about 100 yards away. So he can see this, but he's not yet there. He's not going to be taken. And so the police come in and they bust this house of prostitution and they take out the prostitutes and they take out the men who had come there to be with the prostitutes and they take all of them out and they lead them out in handcuffs to be incarcerated and the man who is now a hundred yards away from this house on his way there who has been spared who can witness her judgment is terrified by this judgment in one sense and in another sense, begins to mourn because he's saying to himself, he's saying to himself, where now am I going to find a prostitute? Do you see? That's a picture of what sin does. The response of what these kings and the response of what these merchants should have been is, that is the end of worldliness. Worldliness is now coming to nothing. Babylon in all her glory is now a desolate ruin, showing me that the pursuit of worldliness can come crushing down in a day. I can chase fame, I can chase riches, I can chase immorality, but in the end, when God's judgment comes, I'm left with nothing but God's judgment. But instead of being sobered up and seeing that and turning from their sin, they are mourning because sin has taken grip in their hearts. And they want everything that Babylon once offered them that cannot be found anymore in her. That is why they are mourning. This is the effect of sin. This is why we can find people in life who can watch people destroy their lives by abusing alcohol. They can watch themselves be destroyed. See it and then turn around and pursue abusing alcohol themselves. 
Or they can watch a man leave his family to chase after sexual morality and destroy his family and then turn around and pursue sexual morality himself. Or they can see a man who, who chases riches and at the end of his life has nothing as he stands before Jesus Christ and get be drawn away by riches. And we could use example after example of specific sins, but the picture is always the same. Sin is deceiving. And sin is hardening, and sin is blinding. And so these pictures then of these kings and these merchants mourning because they can no longer pursue their sin because Babylon is being judged is a picture of what can happen to us. And this is why we must flee from sin so that it doesn't take grip on our hearts. So we've seen the truth. Babylon, the worldliness, is one day going to be stripped away and shown to be the nothing that it is. The exhortation, therefore, flee from what is fleeing. Run from it. The danger. Running after the sin of this world can leave us deceived with hard hearts and blinded to what is real. And now let me end then with a word of encouragement. Those who hold fast in faith to Christ will be able to rejoice on that great and terrible day when God judges His enemies. Those who hold fast in faith to Christ will be able to rejoice on that great and terrible day when God judges His enemies. Now, this lure of worldliness that had just taken grip of everyone's heart in Rome, and this has been repeated again. Rome is just one manifestation of this, but we've seen it in all, all the ages. This worldliness that took grips in the heart of Rome meant that believers suffered. Believers stood in the way of chasing after what the world has to offer. The trade guilds, as they prospered, meant those in Rome could be built up in wealth. So as Christians said, I don't want to be part of it because I don't want to devote myself to the false god that that trade guild is devoting themselves to. Christians were costing some in the pursuit of riches. Christians were standing against and denouncing sexual morality. You see, Christians, as people pursue worldliness, stand in the way, and therefore Christians suffer. You remember Paul in the story of Acts, as, as he has a girl who, who is under demonic influence, and she's able to do things by the power of Satan, and people are profiting off her, when all of a sudden Paul speaks and rebukes her and overpowers the power of Satan with the message of Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. And you know what happens? Those who made profit off of her now all of a sudden turn against Paul, and they hate him. They persecute Christians because we stand in the way. We stand as a, as a word of conviction. We stand as an, an example that is contrary to that, and therefore we've suffered, and the same thing happened here. So therefore, in verses 21 and following, when this is pronounced judgment, the angel took up a stone like a great millstone, threw it into the sea. Babylon, the great city, will be thrown down with violence. and will be found no more. All of these things that, that made up this luxurious culture in Babylon, harpists, musicians, flute, pl flute players, uh, trumpeters, craftsmen, uh, the mill they're working, the weddings that were going on, the merchants of the earth, all of these things that had been deceived by, by Babylon's demonic worldliness are now no more. Verse 24, And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all who have been slain on the earth. You see, when Satan uses the deception of worldliness to lead people away from Jesus Christ, then they also turn against. They are enemies of Christ's people. And this is what had been happening in Rome so that believers had been persecuted, even killed. So what then is the message of this, the scene of a final judgment as God's bringing judgment upon his enemies, the message to believers is found in verse 20. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. You see, as individuals in the first century were under Roman persecution, and some had been killed and were in heaven with the Lord, crying out, Lord, how long will your people have to endure this? How long before you come and bring judgment on the world? The Lord had said to them at one point, wait a little while, more of you are going to be killed. But Revelation 18 says, but that day will come. 
The day will come when the Lord responds to the prayers of the martyrs and He will judge her enemies. And it is going to be a terrible day. It is going to be a terrible day when the Lord Jesus Christ descends to judge His enemies because as we've already seen in the book of Revelation, their punishment will be terrible. Thrown into an eternal lake of fire where they are tormented without rest day and night. We saw that their judgment will be so violent that it is pictured as an individual walking in a wine press, stepping on grapes so that the juice of the grapes run out. But in this metaphor, instead of it being grapes that are being stepped on, it will be the enemies of the Lord so that, as Revelation told us, the blood of Christ's enemies will run out and the blood will fill as high as the horse's bit in his mouth for miles. That's not to be taken literally. It is to be taken as an image of how violent and eternal judgment will be. And on that great and terrible day when God comes to judge His enemies. If you've turned from worldliness and you've held fast in your faith to Jesus Christ, it will be a day you can rejoice. This is why we sing, when we sing the song, It Is Well. We sing of that great day when Jesus Christ will return and the cloud clouds will be rolled back as a scroll. The trump will resound and the Lord shall descend to judge His enemies. And even so, even so, it is a terrible scene of judgment. It is also our salvation. Even so, we say in the song, it is well with my soul. On that final day when God's enemies are being judged, it will be because He is coming to save His people. Therefore, hold fast. The Lord knows the temptation that those were facing in the first century, and He knows the temptation we're facing today. Listen, the Lord is not oblivious to the seduction of the harlot. He's not oblivious to the seduction of this world. He knows that right now, you and I can be easily tempted to rebel against Christ and pursue riches, rebel against Christ and pursue prestige and fame, rebel against Christ and pursue sexual morality of all kinds. And He's saying to us, don't go after it. It's empty, it's fleeting, it's demonic. Don't go after it because I'm going to judge my enemies. Don't even... Don't even Flirt with it because it can deceive you and harden you and blind you and take grip on your heart. Don't even flirt with it. But hold fast to Jesus Christ and on that day when He comes to judge His enemies, you will be found in Him rejoicing. And so Revelation 18 then, I think is given to us as something to call us back to reality. Look at this world as it is. Don't be deceived by what's in front of your eyes, but look at the city that is eternal. Therefore, if you're not a believer this morning in Jesus Christ, Revelation 18 is calling you to repent. Revelation 18 is reminding you that you may have spent your life pursuing all this world has to offer in rebellion to Jesus Christ, and therefore you're under the judgment of Jesus Christ. However, Jesus lived a perfect life of obedience, died on the cross to pay for the sins of anyone who will believe in Him, was raised on the third day so that right now you'll repent of your sins and place your faith in Jesus Christ. You can be forgiven and have eternal life. If you're not a believer, that's the message of this text. And I plead with you this morning, if you're not a believer, place your faith in Jesus Christ. If you are a believer this morning, and perhaps you've already been pursuing Babylon and worldliness, the call to us this morning is to repent of our sins and flee. The call to us this morning is to say, I do not want to chase after what is fleeing and repent of that, confess our sins to the Lord Jesus Christ and flee to the cross. Flee in faith to the one who lived and died and who was raised for us. And then after we have fled to the cross and found the forgiveness that is ours through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, then to pursue a life of obedience in the midst of a culture that is running after Satan. Therefore, this morning, let's take a moment of silence. In this moment of silence, just use this moment of silence just to respond to this text. Just ask yourself, Lord, how is it? Ask the Lord, Lord, how is it that you want me to respond this morning? In that moment of silence, the ushers will come forward, the musicians will get in place, and in a little bit, we're going to pass out the bread and the cup. We want to invite believers who have professed faith in Jesus Christ who are in good standing with an evangelical church to take part in this this morning. This morning, it will be our opportunity to proclaim we are turning from worldliness 
and following the Lamb who gave His body and blood for us. It will be an opportunity for us to be reminded of why it is that we really can be forgiven as we have pursued sin. If you're not a believer, please do not take of this bread and drink of this cup. That would be a lie. It's to say that you have part in the one who bled and who gave His body. But we do invite you to place your faith in Jesus Christ. And then, and then to show that faith publicly by being baptized. Please place your faith in Christ this morning. Let's take a moment of silence now as we prepare to come to the table.